Wow, welcome back. This is the last session of the day and the last session of the whole conference for the 2021 Good Food Conference. We're so delighted that you're here with us and I hope you've enjoyed today as much as I have. I thought the label censorship panel was just incredible, such an active chat um, going on while all of these experts were talking about restrictions on labeling and how we make things more fair for alternative protein providers. Um, so a few housekeeping items after we close this plenary, um, this platform will stay open for 30 more minutes and you can use that time to network, to go visit folks in the expo hall. We've got more than 50 um, different people displaying there or to watch any replays. Um, after that time, we will eventually migrate the videos to our GFI YouTube channel um, as part of our commitment to open access information. And so you can access the content that you may have missed there or watch another you know, session a second time. I think some folks in the regulatory panel said they wanted to have a second listen. Um, we also have a survey that we would love for you to fill out. We'll be sharing the link with you now um, and we'll pin it at the top of the chat please take a few moments to give us feedback on how we did at this conference. We always are trying to do better and we really appreciate any feedback you're able to provide. Um, all right, so for this last session, Ezra Klein from the New York Times sat down with Bruce this week, hitting many of the key issues that we've covered in the conference over the past three days. Let's have a listen in. I am Ezra Klein, a columnist at the New York Times, host of the Ezra Klein Show podcast, somebody who has taken many of my opinions from my uh, guest here today over the years. And I'm here with somebody who certainly at this conference needs no introduction, Bruce Friedrich, the founder of the Good Food Institute and the man who knows literally every other human being who exists in this entire space. Um, so Bruce, it's nice to be here together. It's really lovely to be here, Ezra. We're uh, we're thrilled uh, that you were able to to find time for this, uh, and of course, thrilled about your support for uh, GFI and alternative proteins from the from the very beginning. Really uh, awesome to have you as a as a champion of this theory of change. Yeah, I'm just a wonderful, wonderful person. Really, something. Um, so let's go back. Uh, you've been working on GFI for for six years. I want to go through a bit of the story of it. So before you start working on GFI. Where are you? What are you doing? What are you rethinking? Um, so I have been working on, so I mean, I, I guess I could, could dial it all the way back uh, to um, studying agricultural economics in college um, and spending a year at the London School of Economics focused on structural adjustment programs and the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, and Very 90s of you. <laughs> but, uh, it was, uh, yeah, I guess it was the very beginning of the 90s, so late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and, and uh, you know, flashing back even further, uh, the book Diet for a Small Planet, uh, which just celebrated its 50th year. So Francis Morlope is, is doing book parties and stuff right now for the 50th year anniversary. Um, and just thinking about the inefficiency of growing lots and lots of crops uh, to feed them to animals so that we can eat animals. So. Uh, as you know, the most efficient animal at turning crops into meat is the chicken. Uh, the World Resources Institute says it takes nine calories into a chicken to get one calorie back out. For uh, beef, it's something like 40 to one. So for a long time, I've been thinking about uh, what we can do about the environmental consequences, the food uh, security consequences of meat production, uh, and then the animal protection, the cruelty to animals uh, on farms and in slaughterhouses. Uh, so this is sort of my motivation. Uh, and since I started thinking about this uh, in the late 80s, uh, per capita meat consumption, uh, even in the United States, where people are most aware of the problems, uh, just keeps going up. So look at looking for an alternative solution and uh, meeting people like uh, Pat Brown uh, and Josh Tetrick and uh, a friend of mine, Tal Ronan, who is on the board of Impossible Foods and uh, those folks being very convincing uh, about the idea that if we can make products that consumers want to consume, uh, that can really be, you know, that can that can basically uh, allow us to decrease uh, the amount of meat that's consumed in the U.S. and globally. 
what creates the idea for the Good Food Institute? What do you begin seeing as a possibility in the space that was not filled a, 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 a mode of activism that, that was not being tried? Like, I wanna hear about the transition from one theory of change for you to another. So before there was GFI, before it had a name, what was the idea here that you thought nobody else was trying, but that you thought you could potentially fulfill? Yeah, I mean, it was less nobody else was trying it um, and more there wasn't a nonprofit organization focused on it. Um, so the inspiration for the Good Food Institute um, was Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, uh, what was then Hampton Creek and is now Eat Just. Uh, and this idea, Ethan Brown puts it at Beyond Meat, puts it extraordinarily well. He says, look, uh, meat is made up of lipids, aminos, minerals, and water. That is all meat is. And the veggie burger market, veggie meats, uh, really put an emphasis on the veggie side of that uh, for the longest time. So they were for vegetarians, they were for flexitarians, they were for people who were willing to pay a little bit more um, and sacrifice a little bit on taste, or they weren't even sacrificing on taste because they didn't like the taste of meat because they were you know, vegetarians or flexitarians. So the brainstorm of these companies is, let's make meat from plants, let's cultivate meat from cells, and because the process is so much more efficient, uh, we can get to a place as it scales up where it tastes the same or better and costs the same or less. Uh, and for me, as somebody who cares a lot about nonprofits and cares about maximum, maximum impact, um, I started thinking, is there something that I could do that would help us to accelerate this entire ecosystem? Um, and what would that look like? So I started having conversations with people like uh, Pat Brown, uh, Ethan Brown, uh, Tal Ronan, Josh Tetrick, Josh Balk, uh, and other friends about you know what their trajectory might look like. Uh, and it became super clear. There's a, a massive void on the science side, a massive void on the policy side, um, and tremendous room uh, to help all, all startups, all investors, the big food corporations to understand this sector. Um, and that was uh, really the genesis of GFI. Go, go deeper into that because I'm I'm fascinated by by this part of it. So you, as you say, the big players here, or at least the, the very well known currently players pre-exist GFI. There's already investment in space, venture capital is moving in. You have the theory or the view that a nonprofit can come in and, and do something that's not being done. So you mentioned a couple of things there. You mentioned policy work, you mentioned corporate education, you mentioned alliances. It seems to me you play a relational role. I joked uh, in the intro that, that you know everyone, but I do think there's some soft ecosystem role that, that you play. Uh, what do you do here? Like, what is your what is your role? <laughs> yeah, I and mean, taking a step back, five, so when I started GFI, uh, there was no Impossible Burger. Um, there was no Beyond Burger. Uh, there were the Beyond Chicken Strips. Um, eat just much was, maligned, but loved by me. Uh, uh, yeah, I love them. I love them too. And you know, one of the early stories about those chicken strips um, was that at a Whole Foods, they accidentally put the Beyond chicken strips. You know, they switched, um, and nobody complained. Nobody noticed. So um, Ethan is now. You know, Ethan uh, says that he's embarrassed by the the early iteration of the chicken strips. Good product. Yeah, I thought so too. You know, and they have a new one that's even better. I don't know. I don't know if you've tried it, but they they pulled that version. Um, and now they have a, a new version that is is really just you know out of this oh, I'm world. Not, I'm not I'm not run into that one yet. So maybe okay. maybe I'll get on the taste right. list somehow. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, so on the science side, what happened was you know Ethan or Pat um, or Josh or whoever they had an idea, and then they had a company. You know, on the cultivated meat side, you've got you know somebody like Uma Valetti or Lou Cooperhouse. They have an idea, and then they have a company, and nobody had laid out the technological readiness. Nobody had figured out what the critical technology elements were. There was almost no uh, peer review science in this space. Uh, so the first thing we did in, in July of 2016 was started hiring scientists. Uh, there also was not a policy theory of change. So you look at something like renewable energy or electric vehicles or sort of anything that is a response to big global problems. And there is an NGO community and a policy community trying to make sure that governments will be supporting policies and putting money into creating this ecosystem. That didn't exist. Uh, and then the third thing that didn't exist, you know, it was, uh, it was a bunch of startups that were excited about this space. 
Uh, but one of the first things we did was started interviewing them. So people like uh, Uma Valetti and Alexis Fox uh, and uh, Josh Tetrick were saying, man, I made so many mistakes in my first six months. What would have been super helpful is what GFI went on to produce, uh, which is a startup manual. So we interviewed all of the pioneers in the space uh, and basically created the, you know, what you didn't know you didn't know uh, about having a company. We also created something called the GF Ideas Community, which now has a, a Slack channel and it's for budding entrepreneurs and budding scientists who are interested in going into this space. So quite literally creating a community, it, it resides at gfi.org slash community. Uh, but lots of different things that uh, are perfect for an NGO and that kind of allow us to have an exponential impact relative to just sort of, you know, your company fails or succeeds with GFI, you know, lots of companies and basically building a scientific uh, and a um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. What, what have you learned about what is needed to build a company in this space or in any, or to build an ecosystem of companies that you would have underestimated before you went into the, into the GFI project? Because you've had a very unusual vantage point on a very, very rapidly rising space and you've changed your approach to it. So I want to know the, the entrepreneurial lessons of Bruce Friedrich. Um, well, I mean, I think the biggest one, and, and we knew that we didn't know what we don't know, uh, but uh, the degree to which you you jump in and you don't know what you don't know um, is, uh, is, I think, you know, somewhat fascinating. Um, at the end of the day, like GFI started, you know, we come out of the effective altruism movement so literally everything that we do uh we think you know is it going to be high impact preferably 10x or 100x or 100,000x um is it neglected uh do we need to do it um and then probably the most crucial one is is it tractable because the number of people who come along and say you know there's this big big problem so you need to do something to solve it the quintessential example i think is subsidies for industrial animal agriculture um, lots of people are working to try to get rid of subsidies for industrial animal agriculture. Um, and every president since Ronald Reagan has been uncomfortable with subsidies for, you know, maybe not Donald Trump, but, you know, certainly Reagan through to Obama uh, were opposed to subsidies for industrial animal agriculture and nobody made any progress on it at all. Um, so maybe that's not an area where we should be focusing. So everything we do, we funnel through, you know, is it the most important? Is it not just, is it a great thing to do? But is it the most important thing we could be doing? Um, and if we apply this pressure, if we do all of this work, do we have a reasonable shot at actually making progress? But that gets at something that I think is distinctive about your view of making progress. So I would say that within the animal rights movement and other points, but, but I don't want to just say in that, um, within a lot of activist movements, there's a tendency to have a very, to want to fight the fight and beat the bad guys, to get rid of the bad policy, to defeat the special interests or the interests who you don't like. And that point you made about tractable, yeah, the point you made about problems that are tractable, it was very interesting. Like what you chose as one there, that's a fight you've decided not to really have. You're gonna try to figure out a way to succeed without being able to uproot industrial animal agriculture subsidies, at least for right now. You've come into um, a lot of different partnerships with corporate players who are part of industrial animal agriculture. So it's not simply that you have left them alone or left them like to do their own thing, but you have also tried to turn them into allies. You've tried to create connections in the space. Tell me a little bit about your theories of collaboration versus confrontation. When when is it worth doing one and when is it worth doing the other? Um, I mean, uh, our GFI's general counsel talks about, uh, she analogizes to uh, playing soccer. Uh, and she says that uh, a lot of the sort of stereotypical you know, movements, you know, I'm thinking in terms of progressive movements, but kind of all movements, um, they want to do everything. And it's like a bunch of five-year-olds and they all charge the ball and they don't make a lot of progress. Uh, so GFI, we really stay in our lane. Uh, and our lane is what can we do to get plant-based and cultivated products that taste the same or better and that cost the same or less. So that's how you win in the market. Um, and one of the decisions that we made early on from a policy standpoint is um, we are not going to be oppositional to industrial animal agriculture. Uh, this can be in their interests and picking a fight with them just doesn't make any sense at all. So 
um, from very early, from the very early days, we were reaching out to ADM and Nestle. We were reaching out to Tyson and JBS and Cargill and Hormel and Smithfield and BRF once we opened a uh, GFI Brazil uh, operation. Um, and we found those folks to be extraordinarily receptive. So there's both the, the sort of, um, you want folks to see this as opportunity uh, rather than as threat. If they see it as opportunity, they will go in. Um, a G, uh, sorry, a Tyson executive at a forum that GFI put together uh, said, we want to be the disruption. We don't want to be disrupted. Uh, the former Tyson CEO, the, uh, a profile of him in Business Week ended with the line, if we can make chicken without the chicken, why wouldn't we? And that seems like a, a pretty reasonable way for them to look at it. Um, and I think it gets us, you know, it, it allows us to advance um, so much more quickly if the folks who understand how meat is made, they have the supply chains, they have distribution. Um, and in terms of uh, in terms of mainstreaming this, from our perspective, and we've heard this from uh, both Pat Brown and Ethan Brown um, at at uh, Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, um, this raises um, all boats because this industry is tiny at the moment. So it helps to mainstream this. It helps to socialize the idea that, yeah, you can make meat from plants, uh, you can cultivate meat from cells, um, or you can use live animals. It's just another way of making meat. Were they surprised? What were some of those early conversations like? Um, I'm sure they Googled you and found you worked at PETA. And <laughs> Were they surprised to hear from you? Were they skeptical? I mean, what was, before the space was as mature, and it's not yet mature, but as recognized as a, as a growing industry that is here to stay, that you have to deal with, that you could be disrupted by. When you started having them, um, what were they like then and how those conversations change now? I mean, it's been, it's been pretty fascinating. Uh, folks were open from the very beginning uh, to this idea. So, um, I mean, you know, it, I have a, a really close friend who I worked with when I was at PETA uh, and I led some of the corporate campaigns at PETA. Um, and he said, you know, these, these, are, these are human beings, like everybody um, wants to make decisions um, that their kids and their spouses will be proud of. Um, everybody considers themselves to be a good person. So you chat with folks who are in the upper echelons of these companies and their, their goal is not uh, to be a part of something, you know, that, that other people think is nefarious. Their goal is to provide high quality protein at a reasonable price to as many people as possible. Um, if we can help them to do that um, in a way that doesn't have all of the external costs, that doesn't have the headaches, that looks good on their SDG, on their sustainability reports, um, Folks are pretty open to that. So um, yeah, I, I published um, a piece in the Wall Street Journal uh, defending Beyond Meat uh, when it took an investment from Tyson Foods talking about how uh, wonderful I thought that was, I think in 2016 or 2017. Um, and her just, and I mentioned my PETA history uh, in the piece and I got multiple really nice emails uh, from people at Tyson about that, which I was very gratified by. Um, so I, I think there may be a little, a little bit of circumspection uh, occasionally at the beginning, but we have world-class scientists. Um, our corporate engagement team is phenomenal. Our policy team is ph phenomenal. It is a group um, of legit professionals um, who want to get the job done. So, you know, the, the sort of proof is in the pudding. Um, our relationship with these companies ends up being great. So, you know, at the conference, we have, I think, most of the major food uh, and meat companies uh, represented. Uh, we have Hormel on a panel, we have Cargill on a panel, we have Cargill sponsoring the conference. Um, we're very enthusiastic about that. We've, we've had multiple forums that we sponsored with Tyson Foods. Um, we've been to all of the offices of all of these companies to chat with them. Um, and we think that, you know, that's, that's how you make maximum uh, positive progress. Let me ask you about the technology here, because fundamentally what you've moved to, you've influenced me on this, is a technologically driven theory of food system change. You're going to create a new technology. It's going to taste as good or better. It's going to be as cheap or cheaper. And you're going to overtake the other technologies you don't like as much in the market. What, we're trying to think about how to ask this question. What happened six, seven, eight years ago that began to unlock some of the, the new generation or what were then the new generation of products here? And what are the technological hurdles that have to be cleared in the next six to seven years to get to 
cheaper and better because we are not certainly a cheaper um, and many of these things aren't even on the aren't even on the docket. But let's start with why then? What had emerged? Because only I mean Pat Brown is a scientist, but a bunch of the other folks running the company certainly were not food scientists, certainly were not chemists, um, and in many cases weren't scientists at all. You're not a scientist. Uh, and yet all of a sudden these new technologies begin to come online. Why? I, I really do think it is, uh, I, I could be wrong, I could be naive, but I really do think it is as simple as uh, some people had the idea and nobody had had the idea before. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I've been um, a vegan for 30, 40 years, I think, uh, and perfectly happy with the plant-based products. Um, and Ethan Brown and Pat Brown, apparently like at the exact same time, essentially, uh, had the brainstorm uh, that we can make meat from plants. I mean, I've heard both of them tell their origin story um, and um, they just realized, hey, look, uh, meat is made up of its constituent points, parts. Um, we can biomimic the precise meat experience, and we can do that with plants. And as it scales up, it will cost less. Um, and I will tell you, in our in our interactions with um, other companies in the plant-based space, including some of the really big players um, that are making plant-based products, um, they've said things like, we thought our target was Boca. And then along came uh, Impossible and Beyond, and suddenly our target is Impossible and Beyond. Like they are lifting uh, the entire sector. But I think it was, I think it was primarily Ezra, a lack of imagination. Um, and somebody comes along and says, "Wait, this is something that can analogize to renewable energy," which I think is the central brainstorm here uh, when you're talking in terms of climate. Is that something like a third of climate change is attributable to food? Something like, according to an article in Nature Food just a couple of weeks ago, 20% uh, is attributable to the meat industry. That's purely direct emissions. That's not even opportunity cost. And so when you're thinking in terms of energy, the goal of solar, the goal of electric vehicles uh, is to get those things where the price and the convenience simply makes them how energy is produced. And that's the same thing with this, uh, but nobody had thought about it that way in the past. The idea of meat had been, if you adopt a vegetarian or a vegan diet, for whatever reason you adopt a vegetarian or a vegan diet, um, you will eat the waste, you know, if you want something meat-like, you will eat the waste product of the soy oil industry, or you will eat the waste product um, of the wheat carbohydrate, you know, bread and, and pasta, essentially, and they cram it together and vegetarians and vegans, you know, we, we eat it and we like it. Um, and along come, you know, these people and they say, wait a minute, I've got this, you know, other idea. Um, we can, our market is not the few billion dollars that we can sell uh, to people who are willing to pay more um, and sacrifice on taste or don't see it as sacrifice on taste. Our market is the entire meat industry. Um, and hey, we can win because this is a much more efficient way of producing the meat that people like. Why is it? technologically still more expensive. And and the way I wanna ask this question is, you made the point earlier to raise a chicken, you get nine calories in for one calorie out. These numbers are worse with beef, they're worse with pigs, you need a tremendous amount of land, you need a tremendous amount of shipping. The global supply chain and the inputs to a lot of industrial animal agriculture, or, or to say nothing of non-industrial animal agriculture are, are really intimidating. And yet I go to the market, and my Beyond sausages are 10 bucks, and my Beyond breakfast sausages are seven, and my Impossible Burger is 10, and you know, just egg is more expensive than, than egg. So if it is so much more direct a process, what are the technologies that are missing or are underdeveloped to actually begin having something that sounds like it's more efficient to actually be cheaper? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a big part of it, that there is a lot of technological advancement that can happen. So there is a lot that can happen in crop characterization. There's even more that can happen in manufacturing. Christy Lagali uh, from Rebellious Foods was talking on the first day of the conference um, about how the technologies, still the technologies uh, used for the plant-based products um, are decades old. So there is a lot of innovation that can happen on crop characterization. There's a lot of innovation that can happen in putting the products together um, in a way that allows them to thoroughly biomimic the meat experience. Um, and then in manufacturing, there's also a lot of innovation. But I think at the end of the day, Beyond Meat is roughly one gazillionth um, of meat sales globally. Uh, Impossible Foods is slightly smaller than Beyond Meat. So on the one hand, they're accelerating rapidly and growing. 
Uh, but Ethan um, Brown, who runs Beyond Meat, his company's now publicly traded, so he has the quarterly calls. Um, he's saying that they expect their burger to be cost competitive by the end of 2024. Um, so that's a pretty good trajectory uh, for getting to a place where the products taste the same or better and cost the same or less. Uh, but it's not tomorrow, and it's certainly not now. I think there's something like 70% uh, more now. I think the Impossible Burger is something like double now. Um, but the people who run the companies do have their eyes on that prize. Um, none of them want to be niche. All of them are mission driven, uh, whether that's um, whether that's climate um, or biodiversity or animal protection. Um, so none of them want to be, you know, making a bunch of money uh, selling to, you know, East and West Coast elites. They all want to be uh, how meat is made, whether you're talking about the plant-based side or the cultivated side. What, talking about the cultivated side, when do you estimate I or anyone else will be able to purchase a fully cultivated product in either a supermarket or a chain restaurant? Well, when, when, will, when do you think the first one will be widely available for commercial pur purchase? You know, it's, it's, uh, we, we made some predictions in the early days of, of GFI, uh, and I think uh, that, it, that is one of our lessons learned. Um, and, and I will say, you know, you look at something like, I mean, again, like, like a lot of how we think about alternative proteins really is uh, to try to analogize it and to learn from uh, renewable energy and electric vehicles. So, I mean, one of the things that GFI is constantly sort of saying to people is we are not the people going door to door saying, put solar on your house, it's gonna cost a little bit more and be a little less convenient um, or pay extra for an electric vehicle and you're gonna have to you know, wait 45 minutes to charge a car. Um, we're the people behind the scenes on the science side, the corporate engagement side, and most importantly, the policy side, um, helping to bring down the price um, of, in this case, you know, plant-based and cultivated meat products. So you look at the trajectory for something like solar, um, and it required government support, government support in Germany, the US, Japan, and China principally. Uh, so GFI's global battle cry as an organization, and we're now north of 135 full-time staff, uh, about 70 in the United States, about 65 across our five international affiliates. And the global battle cry is governments need to throw in because without alternative proteins, we do not meet our obligations under the Paris Climate Agreement. Meat consumption per capita, even in developing developed economies, keeps going up. Uh, globally, it's going to be something like 70 to 100 percent more by 2050. And this is the only solution to the problem that scales. Um, so mm -hmm. governments need to be funding the science and they need to be incentivizing private sector activity. Um, if we are successful in that, so we put out a, a techno-economic analysis on the cultivated meat side that says by 2030, with some technological breakthroughs and some government support, um, we could have cost competitive burgers. Uh, but that is kind of a big if, although we're optimistic. We feel like the biodiversity community is getting behind these technologies. Uh, the climate community is getting behind these communities. And we're hopeful uh, that folks who care about pandemic risk uh, and antibiotic resistance can also see this as something that they should be supportive of. If we get governments behind it, it could, you know, we could certainly hit the 2030 metric. Um, and one of our, the, our vice president for science and technology was looking at the cost curves for solar. Um, and she said, yeah, 2030 is aggressive uh, for cultivated meat burgers at price parity. Um, but if we're really successful on the policy side and get lots of scientists you know, worked up about it, it could be quicker. So this is a, a, an important point uh, that you, the renewable energy sector did build a lot of policy backing into its big advances and still is. I mean, there's been a lot of subsidy over years, but if you look at what is happening in the budget reconciliation bill, which, you know, fingers crossed, um, there's a lot built in there. There's a lot of public money for battery technology, a lot of public money for um, uh, electric battery charging infrastructure, all kinds of things. What can the, there's much the private sector can do. What do you want the public sector to do? Is it just funding basic research? Is it subsidizing consumer purchases? I mean, what are you actually, what would the ideal policy regime for you look like? Yeah, I mean, we were really uh, delighted that you wrote about um, our request um, of the Biden Build Back Better plan. Uh, we do think, um, and really like that you said, uh, $2 billion is not that much money. 
Um, but um, yeah, yeah, but nobody I mean, listened to me. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you you were uh, you you were an early uh, an early voice crying out in the wilderness, but uh, I think people will come around. Um, so just like there are climate centers uh, focused on renewable energy um, at university campuses all over the world, um, there should be centers focused on plant based and cultivated meat um, at most or all of the land grant universities, including the 1890 land grant universities, the historically black. Uh, college uh, land grant universities, and that should be happening globally. Um, and one of the things that that we point out is, you know, Joe Biden, the American Jobs Plan, um, it's one jobs, two infrastructure, and three out innovate China. Uh, we really want a global, you know, space race type resources uh, focused on plant based and cultivated meat. Um, and what that means is absolutely open access R and D on the top university campuses for food science and tissue engineering and plant biology and meat science. Uh, but it also means private sector incentives, uh, both for the startups, the Beyond Meats, the Impossible Foods, the Upside Foods, the Blue Nalu, uh, and the rest. Uh, but it also means subsidies to the really big food and meat companies, the ADMs, the Nestle's, the Tyson's, the Cargill's, uh, to help them shift in this, well, to incentivize them uh, to shift in this direction. And, and obviously it also helps them uh, to shift in this direction. And then we do also need the policy on the other side. I mean, I think one of our lessons learned from the renewable energy side, from the renewable energy sector is you really do need to be thinking early um, about what are the consequences that you don't intend, especially for labor, uh, probably being the big one. And so what do the labor policies look like uh, that catch people? Um, and I let, you know, in your piece, you said, surely we can move from uh, paying farmers for extractive practices to paying farmers for um, basically ecosystem uh, restoration, which I think should be a part of these policies. So, I mean, the people who work in the slaughterhouses, those are, I mean, human rights campaign called those uh, a human rights crime. Like those are pretty much the worst jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, jobs in these factories will be better. Um, and farming has gone to go big or get out uh, without any help from alternative proteins, that's already the trajectory, even without us. So, um, but we should still be thinking about, you know, yes, the policies to incentivize this, yes, the policies for open access research, and then also, yes, the policies for how do we make this um, a transition that, you know, doesn't have casualties. The most surprising thing to me about GFI's evolution of you, pretty much everything else went as I would have expected from, from early on, but is the intensity of your international expansion. Uh, you mentioned you have a number of international offices. I think you said that of your 130 some full time employees, 60 some are in the international side. Tell me a, a, a bit about that and also how you begin to operate in places that, you know, have very different cultural frameworks, very different governmental systems, different lobbying structures. I mean, when I first met you, you lived in DC, you still do, I believe, or near DC. So you you knew that town a bit. It's intimidating to start working in India, intimidating to start working in Brazil. How how is that gone? Like what is your theory of what you can bring to that that, that others can't? Um, well, what uh, what GFI uh, can bring to that 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 others can't. I mean, we we the vast majority of the work that we're doing, uh, we're still the only ones doing it. Um, I will say that uh, that is not our goal. Um, we are the opposite of proprietary. We are trying to build uh, an ecosystem when we chat with uh, NRDC or EDF or a League of Conservation Voters. We want as many competitors uh, in this work as we can possibly create, uh, but there isn't anything uh, in Brazil uh, or India or Singapore uh, or Europe that's doing the work that we are doing. Um, so it was just vast need. Um, again, we look at um, how has renewable energy worked? Uh, and there were a bunch of governments with governments willing to fund science um, and world-class scientific institutions. So uh, the reason we're in Brazil is it's a government willing to fund science and Brapa uh, has just lots and lots of meat and plant scientists who are superb uh, and they have world-class scientific institutions. And that's true of every place that GFI operates. I mean, our big well, goal is- Bolsonaro's Brazilian government has been willing to fund alternative proteins. Bolsonaro. I'm actually curious. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm genuinely oh, yeah. curious. I'm half Brazilian. I'd like to know. Yeah. No. It's. It has been. Uh, it has been very surprising. Uh, the support from the Bolsonaro government, and we signed an MOU uh, with the Amazon state, uh, and we have had direct uh, interactions with 
uh, the vice president uh, of Brazil, who is very sympathetic. Uh, this is one where having government, we're having uh, industry connections is extraordinarily valuable. I mean, I went to I went to Brazil, uh, and Sao Paulo was having um, a biotechnology week, a bioeconomy week, um, and the first. So first, they had uh, the Brazilian military brass band. Then they had their minister of science. Uh, then they had me talking about alternative proteins with instant translation. Uh, because Brazil doesn't want to be left behind. Um, and that's because JBS and BRF, which are their two biggest meat companies, and globally, they're number one and number five, the other three are in the United States, um, are excited about both plant-based uh, and cultivated meat. Um, so, you know, the messaging is obviously a little bit different. We hired um, somebody who has a strong corporate background in Brazil. He worked for Whirlpool for a bunch of years. Um, super smart guy. Uh, we hired a lobbyist who has been lobbying in Brasilia uh, for a bunch of years. Um, and then we started building out a team uh, with scientists and corporate engagement people, um, and they're phenomenal. And um, so with our, we have a competitive grant program. We give away some millions of dollars. We have three, um, three people who fund it, it's $5 million total. Um, the first year we did it, we had no applications from Brazil. Uh, the second and third years, Brazil came in second to the United States. Um, and that's because the government of Brazil was organizing seminars for GFI to present to Brazilian government agricultural scientists. So, um, and a, a similar story could be told about uh, India, Israel, Singapore, and Europe. Um, and we picked those countries not because of how much meat anybody eats. We picked those countries on the basis of governments that are interested in funding the science um, and world-class scientific universities uh, to do the science. So we're not in Israel or Singapore because we care what people are eating uh, in Israel and Singapore. We're there because their governments are very supportive um, of alternative proteins and they have world-class scientific institutions uh, to do that work. What have been the big international accomplishments for you all? Um, so I think getting uh, the, so uh, working with the Brazilian meat industry to move in this direction um, has been pretty great. Uh, the stuff that we're doing in Israel um, so Benjamin Netanyahu was the first uh, head of government to consume alternative to consume cultivated meat, um, and uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, two days before he was meeting uh, with Joe Biden, uh, reached out to our managing director for Israel, who came in and gave him um, a presentation about our policy plan for Israel, um, and that government has put millions of dollars uh, into this space. So, I mean, the, the stuff that we're most excited about um, is, you know, creating an, a, a scientific ecosystem on the one side. Um, and getting governments excited about it and funding it on the other side. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in India, Israel, Brazil, uh, Singapore, and Europe, both in Brussels um, and in the United Kingdom. So most recently, we spent about a year working uh, with the team that was put together in the UK to make recommendations for their national food strategy. Um, and they ended up recommending uh, 75, mil well, 125 million pounds, so something like $180 million. Uh, for private sector incentives for alternative proteins, which we're pretty excited about. So the policy framework you all have put forward, uh, I've, I'm on record saying I think it is thoughtful and modest, if anything. Um, it is not, to my knowledge, in the budget reconciliation bill. What have your conversations with the American government been like? What do you, how would you assess the state of play on this in America now? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we're socializing it. So um, we had uh, both USDA and National Science Foundation. You mean getting people up. used to it, not taking over the means of production? No. Uh, yes, okay. uh, get, getting people used to it. Um, so we're making a lot of ingra inroads on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're making inroads at, at USDA and the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. Um, so our science team has presented repeatedly uh, to the Agricultural Research Service, as well as the uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture at USDA. Um, we've done the same thing uh, with the National Science Foundation, and, and that's why we have USDA and NSF represented at the conference. Uh, we have a friend at the Department of Energy, and we're working uh, with him to ensure that alternative proteins uh, can be a part of the DOE uh, loan program that has mostly so far uh, gone to renewable energy projects. Um, and a lot of, a lot of other similar inroads that are um, sort of in that same focus vein. Um, so we do have a bunch of champions uh, in Congress. We heard from Rosa DeLauro um, opening the conference on day one, talking about how she fought to ensure that alternative proteins would be identified as climate science uh, in the appropriations bill. Uh, she got $5 million allocated 
uh, to alternative proteins, which is a, a great start. It's the first um, specific calling out of alternative proteins for a specific amount of money. Um, and maybe an even bigger deal, um, she got alternative proteins identified um, specifically and added as a specific area for the Agriculture and Food Research Institute, uh, which has a $450 million, even before reconciliation uh, tax, a couple hundred million more onto it. So um, we already have the ability through our work with NSF uh, and USDA to allocate money under current programs for alternative proteins. And in 2020, uh, there were two half million dollar projects for plant-based meat, one at Purdue and one at UMass Amherst, um, and then $3.5 million uh, to UC Davis for cultivated meat. Um, and our expectation is that that will you know, grow and grow as we get more champions, both in the on the executive side and the legislative side. It's exciting stuff. Well, uh, I think that is time for us, so we'll end it here. But I hope when we talk again in another five or six years, uh, at the closing plenary, you're going to have a lot more to a lot more to report. Bruce Friedrich, thank you very much for all the work you're doing. Really, really grateful to you, uh, Ezra, for taking time out of your schedule for this, uh, and also for championing uh, these issues on your podcast uh, and uh, in your column. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra and Bruce, for that insightful conversation. Um, so now to wrap up, I was going to say I'm going to invite my colleagues, including Bruce Friedrich, to come up to the stage, but you all have just jumped right in. Um, so welcome to the stage. Um, this, we have a few more minutes to talk about sort of the aha moments we've had from the conference. Um, to share reflections or takeaways from this past few days. I know that for me, um, there was just so much excitement around the role of public policy in building momentum to accelerate progress on, uh, on these issues. And I am interested to hear what you all think. So perhaps I'll, I'll pass it over first um, to my colleague Gus from Brazil. We heard a lot about Brazil in that last conversation. Gus, I'd be interested to hear what you saw as the highlights of the conference and what you might share with this audience. Thank you, Jessica. Well, I have to say I'm particularly excited about the discussions happening on how to make it, how this market of protein will evolve in the south of the world. And in Brazil, we held an excellent debate on the scientific potential of biodiversity and how Latin America is embracing the sector in general. Uh, but it was not the only panel around the topic. Uh, we had a round table with participation from code health organizations and many other multilateral agencies. Um, Dr. Costa, that was the Codex Alimentarium Chair, he said it is essential. He also mentioned about the Codex Observer, which will allow us to work with multilateral systems. And the Food Safety Technical Officer of World Health Organization in the Western Pacific region, the benefits of alternative protein are in micro, antimicrobial resistance, safety, and she sees alternative protein as a strongly related to the world's health um, subjects and discussions. So in my opinion, it is fantastic to see that this subject is now really global and is becoming an essential part of the world's health the future now. Gus, I think you make a great point. It's been so exciting to have U.S. members of Congress come and give their support to alternative protein research in this conference. We've also had the USDA, um, which oversees the regulation of cultivated meat, um, the National Science Foundation, and countless other uh, government officials. So it's just so exciting to see the progress. I want to uh, go halfway around the world to Varun, who's joining us from India. Varun, what, what are your takeaways and what stood out to you about the conference and how will it catalyze what we do next? Thanks, Jessica. Um, well, we've all already spoken about how um, support from governments has been extremely heartening. Uh, and I think this isn't a competition, obviously, but I am in Asia and 60% of the world's population will be in Asia through 50 to 60% will be in Asia through 2050. So if this were a competition or a space race, uh, we would really want to focus a little bit on Asia, right? I, I'm, I've been really heartened by our wonderful colleagues in GFI APAC and GFI India putting on great panels, as well as some great China US mixers and some roundtables in APAC. I think the, the major takeaways that we've seen are we need to localize supply chains, integrate backwards into agri-supply chains, install infrastructure, and really think of this as the next 
great pillar of climate resilience, much like renewable energy has been. And I, that, that's been a refrain throughout the, the conference. And I think um, overall, uh, it's a huge part of the maturation of the industry that we're having these conversations now, because over the last two or three years, even we haven't been able to have these conversations and bring these people into the room, right? So thinking through really innovative financing instruments, really innovative opportunities to integrate backwards into these agri supply chains and, and really build this industry and build a roadmap for this industry, it's been really heartening to see these conversations. So for example, Monila Kothari of, of Jivodan, which is a, obviously an industrial leader in the space, talking about how if we hit certain tipping points for, for cost basis, there's no reason that it couldn't take off. Alternative proteins couldn't take off in a huge way in Asia. Uh, Elaine Chung from Temasek saying something similar, right? So we're seeing people from industry and investment express confidence in the category. And I think getting there is a matter of putting in the work and making sure that we're establishing these multi-stakeholder partnerships, getting government involved, getting multilaterals involved, as, as Gustavo just said. So I think there's a long way to go, but we have something of a game plan, something of a roadmap, and the conference has been a great milestone in that regard. Thank you, Varun. Caroline, uh, all of this talk of in infrastructure um, and supply chains um, and the, the incredible corporate leaders that we've had present in the conference uh, must be really exciting to you. I'd love to hear kind of your reflections on the last few days. Absolutely. Yes, it's been a very exciting um, few days and there's there's just so much. It's kind of hard to whittle it down. Uh, you know, first, I really enjoyed my conversations with Lisa from Stray Dog Capital and Amy at Upside Foods. And really every session I joined was just full of really great insights and a lot of innovative thinking. Um, but I think what, what really stuck out for me um, was the increasing recognition of the necessity of alternative proteins in any conversation around ESG, climate, uh, or biodiversity. So hearing this from leaders at top financial institutions like Credit Suisse and Barclays, along with um, from a leading climate foundation, NGOs, and even the World Economic Forum was really impactful. I think it was Eugene Clerk from Credit Suisse who said, you know, that basically that COP26 will be a disaster if food isn't a central part of it. And then Lisa Sweet from the World Economic Forum, you know, said that business as usual is not an option when it comes to the protein of tomorrow. But, you know, even with this growing acknowledgement um, of the key role that alternative proteins will play in mitigating climate change, it's clear that the sector is still way underinvested in as a climate technology solution. So, you know, as, and another theme that has come up, right, we need more funding from both the public and the private sectors. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing increased conversation around that um, and action as we come out of the conference. I agree. I'm feeling a tremendous sense of urgency to get this work done and this excitement, but also this, this huge opportunity that's before us with a very limited time horizon because of how quickly our climate is changing. Um, Liz Fact heads up our science and technology department. Liz, um, what are your takeaways from this week's conference? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. I am feeling incredibly energized, perhaps unsurprisingly. I think the, the technical sessions were the most uh, exciting for me. What I thought was probably the most remarkable thing was that we were getting really concrete interplay between some of these specific big picture challenges that were, we were hearing on the discussion panels and then uh, responses essentially to those challenges in the more data heavy presentations from researchers who are actively working on developing solutions that address each of those challenges. So for example, we were hearing about bottlenecks in scaling up infrastructure for plant protein enrichment and structuring. And then we had multiple researchers speaking about their work to develop non-extrusion structuring methods or to develop higher throughput crop fractionation processes. Um, likewise, there was a lot of discussion beyond protein moving into fats, which of course are essential for flavor, and some of the potential impending supply chain bottlenecks for animal-free fats that behave like animal fats. And then to complement that, we heard from multiple academic researchers and at least three different companies who are working on novel fat solutions by leveraging microbial production or 
developing scalial ole oleogels or a, a whole suite of solutions to that challenge. Um, likewise, talking about greater crop diversification, how this, this industry needs to move away from the paradigm of huge commodity monocultures that have been such a hallmark of the conventional animal industry. Um, we then had folks talking about their work on developing new specialty crops or doing high throughput crop breeding to optimize the inputs for alternative proteins. We even had researchers talking about leveraging side streams from other agricultural processes. Um, again, going back to Brazil, the, the work on cashew apple uh, as a side stream input to alternative proteins comes to mind here. Um, so I think, you know, if anything, this week has made me feel much more confident than ever that even though there's still an enormous amount of technological progress that's needed, we're finally starting to get the type of visibility that this field really needs to attract the attention of the world's most talented minds um, to push on these, these projects. Um, and I think having all of these, these representatives from the research field also put a human face on the underlying technology that's so critical here. These advances aren't happening on their own. These are the result of, of you know, really dedicated researchers who exist within these robust communities. Um, so I was very, very gratified to hear a lot about community building efforts, developing a true collaborative research ecosystem, all the way from students and academics uh, through to, to industry researchers, government labs, government funding agencies, the whole picture really needs to come together for this. And speaking of encouraging the brightest minds to join in this effort, um, there were a few exciting announcements during this year's conference. One this morning from Jess Krieger, who said when I was interviewing her that she is launching an, a mentorship program for women in STEM who are interested in alternative proteins and specifically cultivated meat because she hadn't kind of seen that kind of representation when she was working on her PhD and creating her first company. Um, Liz, you had an exciting announcement as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the grant program and the announcement that you made? Absolutely. Yeah, our announcement just, uh, just launched yesterday that we um, we're announcing our next cohort of grantees from our competitive research grant. This is adding about $5 million to the pool of open access research funding um, within the alternative protein space. And as we've touched on multiple times throughout this conference, that research funding is really a critical bottleneck. Um, and there's, there's such a catalytic uh, effect of some of these these early grants that act as essentially seed funding to get new investigators thinking about these types of, of problems and training new mentees, speaking to our discussions on workforce and talent development. Um, so really this this program acts as, as a catalyst. Again, maybe that word is overused, but I think it's apt here um, that every single one of these projects then uh, positions investigators to be competitive for follow-on funding, um, to go and present their findings at conferences in a number of different disciplines that put this on the radar of researchers across all these different fields, and to, to give training opportunities to folks who will ultimately enter the alternative protein workforce. And it's it's notable that some of GFI's grantees have gone on to get um, some of the first investments by the U.S. government in alternative protein research. So, and I know there were numerous worthy applications that we're not able to fund. So there really is a need for a public investment in this kind of research as well. Finally, Bruce Friedrich, I'm sure you have thoughts about this conference. Um, this is uh, the first time we've done it virtually, but certainly not our first Good Food Conference. I would love to hear from you, kind of big picture, how this conference has evolved from previous years and what was most exciting to you about this year's conference. But you have to come off mute to tell us. Yeah, I know. Sheila Sheila's going to be so disappointed in me. Um, but uh, yeah, I have been um, really just blown away and I've gotten so many positive comments about um, all of my work on the conference. So I've had to say over and over, um, I didn't really do uh, any work on the conference. So uh, mega kudos uh, to Sheila, um, our Vice President for Communications and 
uh, Ingrid Eck, uh, sort of her second on the communications team and all of the uh, programmatic teams, Liz's and Caroline's and Jessica's teams uh, and uh, the three of you, as well as our international uh, managing directors for the uh, panels that they put together. It's really just been a, a phenomenal, I think, um, sort of snapshot of where we are. And it's quite remarkable to, to think about the fact that five years ago right now, uh, the Impossible Burger was available in one restaurant in the entire world. Uh, the Beyond Burger was available in nine Whole Foods uh, in the entire world, I think seven in uh, the Denver area and two in the DC area. We were very excited to have them come to DC first. Uh, and I imagine Caroline was excited to have them come to Denver first. Um, and um, five years ago right now, there were um, I think maybe half a dozen cultivated meat companies and uh, only Upside had raised significant money. So it's really just remarkable uh, what has happened in the last five years. And uh, this conference was uh, I think just sort of off the hook, uh, different uh, and more as we were billing it, uh, really a 301 in terms of alternative proteins um, rather than the 101, which were the GFI conferences uh, in 2018 and, and 2019. And the thing that underlines that for me, um, segueing into sort of my big takeaways from the conference, Liz talked about the technical sessions um, and I really tried to sit in on as much of the technical sessions as I could, even though I didn't understand uh, <laughs> most of what people were talking about. Uh, but that, that really underlines, I think, the 301, 401 nature. Um, and I thought Liz kicked off the concept super well uh, with her conversations with uh, Eric Toon from Breakthrough Energy Ventures and Tom Khalil. Uh, from Schmidt Futures. And anybody who hasn't seen that sort of fireside chat of what it takes uh, to focus on science and create an industry. Um, and the discussion, especially of the idea of a breakthrough and the idea um, of a moonshot and the idea um, of science. Um, I think it was Tom who said something about, you know, you become, I'm not going to get this right, but basically the idea was, yes, you want to become a scientist, but you also want to have something that you're trying to accomplish in the world uh, beyond sort of knowledge and information, which is critically important, but what are you building out of the knowledge and information? Um, and then that fed into all of the technical sessions, the culture media session, the taste profile session, the infrastructure session, the contract manufacturer session. Um, and what it all ends up with, uh, I think, is this is super hard, um, but it's possible, uh, which is basically what, what Liz just said. Um, and then the second of sort of my three take homes is just the overwhelming amount of cooperation in this field. So I just loved listening to Jamie Athos, uh, the CEO of Tofurky, and Amy Chen, the COO um, of Upside Foods, and Uma Valetti and Mark Post, um, and uh, Maggie Rashani uh, from Nobel Foods and Impossible Foods and Cargill. Um, and all of these companies talking about what it takes to work together uh, to create uh, the alternative protein industries and just the level of um, cooperation and mission alignment. Um, and simultaneously, we can get this done um, if we all work together. I found just kind of inspiring um, and overwhelming. Um, and that feeds into my third point, which is just uh, the urgency uh, which multiple people um, have uh, also flagged. Um, the direct emissions uh, attributable, attributable to uh, industrial animal agriculture are about 20% um, of all climate change, according to an article in Nature Food last week. Um, we will not get to zero emissions uh, if ruminants are still putting methane uh, into the atmosphere and manure decomposition is causing nitrous oxide. Uh, the indirect emissions, as I mentioned in the chat. Um, so the fact that it, three out of four uh, billion hectares of land that are attributable uh, to agriculture go into animal agriculture. Um, if we repurpose that land for ecosystem reconstruction, that's 25 gigatons uh, per year um, of ecosystem restoration, carbon sequestration. 
So we're not going to meet our Paris goals without that. Um, and that's why we need the cooperation. And that's why we need the technical sessions. And that's why we need the scientists. And that's why we need to figure this out together. Um, and then we've got the people to do it. Uh, we've got the NGO sessions. We've got uh, Rosa DeLauro uh, kicking off uh, the entire conference. We've got Representative Haley Stevens from Michigan, uh, two champions uh, in a Congress um, on climate. And uh, as Jessica said in the chat, 46 members of Congress signed on to a request, a dear colleague letter, uh, asking for $200 million for open access R&D uh, into alternative proteins. We've got a bunch of uh, Senate champions as well. Um, so I really, I'm, you know, I'm walking away from the conference feeling um, incredibly energized um, and absolutely like we can get this done um, if we can bottle uh, all of the remarkable uh, and wonderful uh, energy that I've experienced from from all of the all of the panelists and all of the attendees. So uh, it's not going to be easy. It is a steep climb, uh, but I'm I'm walking out uh, more convinced than ever uh, that we can get it done if we all work together. Here, here, and as we officially conclude our 2021 Good Food Conference, I want to thank all of our sponsors. I want to especially thank our presenting sponsor, Stray Dog Institute as well as each of these brilliant companies that are working to change the global food system for the better. Um, and that, my friends, is a wrap. On behalf of the entire GFI crew in the United States and around the world, you have our deep gratitude for joining us over these past three days. Um, and we are especially grateful for all of the work that you each are doing in your corner of the world to achieve a future where alternative proteins are no longer alternative and helping to create a more sustainable, secure and just foods future for us all. Keep it up and thank you. Yeah.